Welcome, comrades, to the Spectre of Communism podcast. Like a lot of British radicals of a certain age, I first became seriously politically active around about 2015 with the election of Jeremy Corbyn to the head of the Labour Party. There was a huge movement of support by young people in particular behind Jeremy Corbyn, who presented a program of free education, of reinvestment in public services, and he came as part of a wave of massive support for left-wing figures like in Greece with Syriza, in Spain with Podemos, in France with Mélenchon, in America with Bernie Sanders, that was really a reaction to the politics of austerity that followed the 2008 crisis. But of course, it all ended in tears. Corbyn was ultimately routed by the right wing and ousted, despite nearly coming to power in 2017. And now we have Keir Starmer, who was carrying out austerity and facilitating genocide. So how did we get here? And to help us answer that question, we have somebody who saw the Corbyn movement from the inside, Matt Zarb cousin who is a former spokesperson for Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. It was very unlike anything I'd ever done um, and anything I ever will do. A spectre is haunting Europe. The spectre of communism. Communism. Stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just I want to get more communist. into how you found your way into the middle of that maelstrom and what it looked like from the inside. But first, I'd like to introduce our other speaker, Sean Hodges, who is a leading member of the Revolutionary Communist Party. He also became politically active during the Corbyn movements. And the experience of that movement ultimately led him towards revolutionary communism. Is that fair to say, Sean? I think it's very fair to say. Obviously, I was a, a touch younger and more handsome back then. I had a full head of hair for a start. Yeah, but, I knew uh, it. It's true. A huge amount of lessons, I would say, learned from that personally and, and politically. So, yeah, very glad to, to talk about it and what those were. And I think that the lessons really uh, should be the focus of this discussion because I don't think that... It's impossible. In fact, I think it's inevitable that we'll see movements like the Corbyn phenomena again in Britain and beyond. And we have to learn what went wrong and why ultimately Corbyn and the left were routed. But let's start at the beginning. Matt, how did you find your way into Corbyn's inner circle and what was it like? So my my politics or my interest in politics came from uh, addiction recovery and trying to understand the structural reasons why I... I'd become addicted to gambling. I just became very, very interested in politics following that and was always, as a result, saw myself as on the left, definitely on the left of the Labour Party. The jo- Joining the Labour Party was a decision I took in 2009. It was a, um, a pragmatic sort of decision based on the fact that we have a two-party system and, you know, the, the best way of trying to turn it left-wing policies is through, I believed, through the Labour Party and moving it to the left. So when Jeremy became leader, um, albeit by surprise, it was definitely a project that I wanted to be involved with. I saw the advert uh, for the the job spokesperson. um, I applied for it and I got the job. It's pretty, I mean, pretty straightforward thing. Um, Having to deal with the press lobby that was extremely hostile treated Jeremy as a um a, as a, almost like a virus that needed to be removed um that, that was it was such a shock to me culturally that you know someone who had been at that point it had been in the labor party for six seven years and had sort of grown up around lots of people in my local constituency labor party in you know labor circles who then just basically turned on on me personally, on uh, Corbyn as a leader, on the project, MPs that I'd known in the course of campaigning for gambling reform and had personal relationships with, who then just completely rejected and turned on like Jeremy and would not accept him. And that was really not something I thought would happen after 2015. So I was quite naive about the extent to which the left was not welcome in, in the Labour Party, I thought. The members voted for Jeremy. It's a landslide. He's won in every category of membership. They, they, the, the parliamentary Labour Party has got to get behind him now. Right, that was my naive view. Uh, I had quite, a, I suppose, unique insight into all of the things that they would do 
to try to undermine him um, in my role as spokesperson because I would be interfacing with the the press lobby every day Mm -hmm. and the amount of stories that would be briefed, things that would be leaked, lies that would be told about Jeremy, um, it was on an industrial scale. There was dozens of stories a day that were being briefed to the media in a in a um, very very efficient operation. To, it has to be said mm-hmm. uh, to try to create problems for the leadership and to to crowd out our message. There was a book written recently by Anushka Astana, who was previously a journalist for the Guardian where she goes into some detail about the way that the Labour right schmoozed, in her words, the press in order to undermine Corbyn and ultimately bring him down. Astana writes, As for the Guardian schmoozing, I witnessed that firsthand. At the time, I was the joint political editor at the newspaper and found myself invited with colleagues to a dinner in a private room in the basement of Browns in Covent Garden. We sat on red chairs with gold trimming, set around a long, thin table covered with a white tablecloth, listening to McSweeney, Crudus, Reid, Wigan MP, MP Lisa Nandy and Birmingham Ladywood MP Shabana Mahamu tell us about Labour Together's plans for renewal. So Labour Together was basically one of the right wing Blairite groups that was working to undermine Corbyn. On the one hand, you had the millions of young people and workers who were inspired for the first time by what looked like a genuine way forward. You know, British politics was not a very interesting place. Uh, the only thing that happened yeah, pr- prior, I suppose, that was of some interest was the um, Scottish national referendum. But mm-hmm. Corbyn was really an earthquake. But the real feature of that period was the utter ruthlessness of the right wing MPs in uh, the Labour Party who repeatedly tried to bring Corbyn down, but also the press behind them. Sean, what's your recollection of that period? I mean, yeah, my, my own sort of, I suppose, my own story on it really is, it wasn't just me, it was my whole family actually joined uh, the Labour Party back in 2015. It was, at the time, somebody seemed to be speaking our language, for want of a better way to put it. You know, I said, my dad's a real worker, mum worked for the NHS for many years, Um you know, same with my sisters, actually. They, they're now doing pretty much the same jobs. Um, and he was somebody that actually talked about policies that basically we kind of wanted, you know. And, you know, we wanted the nationalisation of the railways. We fancied having control a bit of, a, you know, aspects of our lives. Of course, we weren't, you know, I wasn't a, a Marxist of any type back then. So, you know, just, just really like what was being said, you know what I mean? So we joined. We thought, well here's a chance to actually have our voice heard for a change. And I, th- I imagine a lot of people thought that, you know, and, and why they joined, you know. Um, really a chance to get stuck in, in a way that they'd never felt any inclination to do before. I mean, geez, what what what, what was there? <laughs> you know, if you want to put it that way. Um, and yeah, look, uh, uh, what Matt said about fe- perhaps feeling a bit naive after the fact, well, I, I, can, I can attest to that, to be perfectly honest, because um, yes, in those early days, I, I confess it, I thought democratic mandate, you know, nice big win. Right, let's go forward. I, I really, in those days, did not realise what was coming. I mean, it was the biggest mandate for a Labour leader candidate in the party's history, I yeah, believe. Yeah, thumping. Absolutely thumping. You know, by any metric you like, you know, you couldn't challenge it. But, of course, that's not what decides these things, as I've come to learn since. Um, and I suppose in, in that light, look, you know, what, what, what we learned, you know, these people... Um, in the Labour Party that were opposing Jeremy. What were their reasons for doing so? Well, these people were real, you know, real pieces of work. But, it, you know, and, and that's how we thought about it at first. Maybe they're just, you know, they're just bastards, for want of a better way to put it. Um, But I think what, what became clear is look, it was more than that. You know, you got characters like Angela Smith. Was that her from Peniston? Yes. Um, you know, water lobbyist extraordinaire. Well, that explains her why she was, you know, so vehemently against it. Of course, she had, you know, vested interest. In fact, they are they are defenders of the capitalist system. Actually, within the labour movement, um, I'm going to give the example perhaps on that front. Look, and, and he's a bit of a bugbear for a good reason. But you think of like Luke Akerst, you know, before he got landed in the safest seat in the country, um. You know, he was a terror on social media, but he was very open about his politics. And I think, actually, there's a lesson in that. Because he was very clear what he thought the Labour Party was for was to moderate and manage the working class, in his own words, to make sure it don't go too far. We don't, you know, we don't want anything too radical. Then to bring down the hammer when necessary. That was the role he thought 
the Labour Party should play. The only difference between him and the others is he would just say it in public. Mm. You know, but these characters, that is what they believed, I think, in, 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 the, back, in the back rooms. Mm. You know, that's what they thought they were doing. Matt, you said that you witnessed some of this manoeuvring and skullduggery firsthand. Is there anything in particular that stands out? Oh, they just lied to the media all the time about things that Jeremy had said, about how meetings had gone. Um, they would leak things. Uh, they would leak things to undermine the impact of announcement. They would create, like, they would create narratives out of nothing that would, you know, seek to undermine not just Jeremy, but, um, you know, his staff and the professionalism of the team. And there was no doubt in my mind that the people in that office were exceptional and they had to be because it's it's all well and good playing politics on easy mode. You know, if you've got the establishment media behind you and you've got you know, the majority of the PLP supporting you, but if you're if you're having to manage your own side, if you're not getting any kind of leeway from the media whatsoever, and you're still managing managing to get the message out in the way that we did in 2017, eventually in, in the election, then you have to be really, really good. And everyone in the office was brilliant. Um, it it was extremely it was extremely difficult to manage the the PLP because they, they was it was they were not operating in bad in um, in good faith they were bad faith actors they were um, they, their agenda I think you're right actually Sean when you were saying about you know, defenders of the capitalist system I think really they're defenders ultimately as well of their careers <laughs> and the pro- the see. promise yeah the promise of eventually landing a ministerial job and then going to work for this kind of um, public affairs industrial complex, right, where you end up going to lobby for the gambling industry or you end up going to lobby for the the water industry, as you mentioned, or as as, um, Chris Leslie went to uh, the the Bayless Association or whatever it was. So, like, you know, it's a... um, they are. They know that their careers depend on their access and their influence of the Labour Party. And if they're not in control, or their faction's not in control of the Labour Party, then they're useless. Yeah. And I, I don't. I don't mean. I don't mean that in like a pejorative sense. Um, I just mean that, that yeah. they, in terms of like advancing their careers, they're they they don't they're, they're not really skilled in anything else. No, they have always, no role all, in society. Of, mm. They have no role exactly, exactly. So they've no, they no skills. They've no like. They've not had many of them have not had a job outside of politics. They've grown up in this um coddled kind of labor uh institution yes. where they've they've been brought from labor students into uh cushy jobs in parliament and then they're parachuted into safe seats and then they they don't even think, oh, I'm gonna try and change things for the better or like that. They're, they're not motivated by that. They're like I'll get that ministerial job and then I'll go and work in public affairs and I'll get a massive salary. And then that that's basically how they how they view politics is like a stepping stone. Well, look at the and likes think, of Wes Streeting. Yeah. I mean, a guy oh, who Jesus that way. was literally his story came mm. up through the student movement, ended up in a position now where he's prepping the NHS to be butchered by private insurance companies. Everybody knows it. He doesn't even particularly try to conceal it. And this tendency for careerism and bureaucratism people who want to ride on top of what's supposed to be a mass party of the working class to get themselves a cushy job to put themselves also at the service of the capitalists Mm. to be the ones basically deciding what the policy of the country is going to be to make sure the boss's profits are protected to make sure their interests abroad are defended but something i wanted to come back on matt you said that everyone in that office was brilliant but as someone who lived through that period what drove me crazy what was so frustrating is it seemed like Corbyn and his team were unwilling to do what was necessary. I remember the chicken coup where you had these resignations by whatever it was, 172 right-wing MPs, flying in the face of the fact that members had overwhelmingly chosen a left-wing leader for the party. And that was the perfect time to bring in mandatory reselection, for example to make it so that every single MP in the Labour Party had to be accountable to the members, had to stand up and say what they actually stood for, to end up 
ultimately, with a unified party, boot out the squatters, boot out the right wing, and have a unified left wing party behind a left wing program. But at every stage, not just then, you know, through the debacle around Brexit, the rubbish around anti Semitism, at every stage, Corbyn seemed absolutely unwilling to break with these people. It seemed like he was afraid of splitting the party. Is that fair to say? I think that, I mean, what you said is, I think is correct with, with the benefit of hindsight. I think, look, they were all very, very good people. And I think that they, um, that, you know, they weren't without, they didn't make, it's not like they didn't make any mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. And I think that was a huge error. And this is something that definitely Max Shanley, my friend, has always advocated for, even with the benefit of, like, without the benefit of hindsight, he was saying from day one, everyone, deselect all of the, Labour right, they're the enemy. Um, and then once we've controlled selections uh, through reforming the party, uh, we will um, basically have a, a supportive PLP and we had to take that programme to the country. Now, there was a belief that, well, first of all, in the early days, we got blind, well, they got blindsided by the addition of, t of additional NEC members um, that represented Scotland and Wales. And then obviously the Labour right put their people in there. Uh, and this meant that Jeremy didn't have a majority on the NEC. So that was the first error. Uh, like they, the, they, the right knew how to kind of play the game and control the system. And, and therefore we had the party against us. So that was, that was the thing that happened early on. And then dealing with everything in that context, once Jeremy had a team and everything like that, um, the view was if we can obviously get through the leadership contest with a renewed mandate, we'll be able to go to the country with a popular agenda. Um, the broadcast rules will kick in, which will mean that we'll get allocated time in the media. It won't be like basically having to, um, you know, ride a wave of negativity in, in the right wing press in order to get our message across to the public, which is a popular message. Um, it will be like, we'll have, a lot of time and it would be very, very different. We had to talk to the country directly. And I think we were just thinking in that in those terms. Now, after 2017, absolutely uh, what should have happened was um, you take advantage of the, the the moment that you're in, you take advantage of all the political capital that you have and you, you enact reforms that would uh, mean that anyone, basically anyone who, who goes against the party gets deselected. And that's basically what Starmer did de facto, right? And he he managed to instill a lot of discipline in the party, um, which I think is what we should have done, 100%. I think after 2017, though, we became almost like, I think because it went very well, we felt like we were close to government. And I think this informed a lot of the thinking then, which was basically, let's not, upend the progress that we've made like got something to lose we've sort of lost that insurgent edge and it was a kind of this is what met, led to things like the fudge on brexit and like i mean the two things jeremy should have done up front after 2017 is say brexit's happening number one mm -hmm. this party will never ever oppose it and number two uh basically anyone who goes against the party will be deselected um, I'm in control of the party now. Like it or like it or leave. Basically, that's yeah. that, that's the clear message you should have given after 2017. And it's easy to say that in hindsight because we were riding such a wave of positivity, and all the PLP were like, obviously, because they knew that they were in trouble, were very very supportive and saying positive things, yeah. and the party felt united. It felt united. And I think we got carried away with that, and um, yeah, I think that was a huge mistake. Sean, what's your recollection of the aftermath of 2017? Because it's true, um, mm. you did have a high point for the movement. Corbyn, we should emphasise again, on a left-wing programme, a more left-wing programme than we'd seen from Labour in living memory, came within a hair's breadth of running the country, and it scared the absolute bejesus out of the ruling class. The press didn't expect it, the polls didn't mm. expect mm. it, the right wing of the party certainly didn't expect it. Um... <laughs> But what's your recollection of what happened afterwards and what Matt was saying about 
sort of losing sight of the need to deal with the problems within the party. Yeah, I mean, I remember waking up to a text from my sister saying, oh, he's done it, you know, he's, he's robbed her of a majority. Where, you know, everybody felt really good about it, I have to say. I mean, I obviously, as you yourself know, Joe, I, uh, I didn't come over to slightly different ways of thinking uh, until about 2018. But by that, the reason that had happened, obviously, is because what happened after, I would have to say, because you did have a period... Um, where the right-wing MPs all looked a bit, you know, Christ, we've, we're have we in trouble now, you know. Um, and they all calmed a bit down, you know, backed off. Um, maybe even adopted a bit of camouflage, dare we say, mm. you know. What they hadn't done is given up. And obviously, uh, yeah, I suppose to a certain degree you say that, that in hindsight. But I tell you what, it didn't take long. You know, that's mm. the thing. You know, probably about late 2017, early 2018, they were back on it again. Um... And of course, look, this question of mandatory reselection, it did come up a lot. You know, it came up in all sorts of ways in the unions, you know, and this, this will they, won't they. And I think for, uh, what I would say is for us on the ground, it was go for it. Absolutely go for it. These guys have put us through hell since 2015. You'll never win and we're going to make sure you don't win and, you know, all this kind of business. Uh, and of course, the, the chicken coup, of course, you'll remember that as well. Mm. Look, their, their argument as well, we, you know, he's, he's failed on Brexit, so he's got to reprove his mandate. Well, all right, now you've got to do it to, to yours. Followed by a another leadership context mm. where Corbyn was once again resoundingly selected. Right. The big thing there was, yeah, the sense we got, because I remember when we really pushed for this this policy... Um, and I, I have to, you'll have to forgive me, Joe, my memory's not what it used to be in my old age, but I, I recall that being 2018, 2019, yeah, 2018, I think it was, we really pushed for it. And, you know, people got messages from some big bods and unite, hang on a minute, you know, don't rock the boat. As, as Matt says, I think that really was the attitude. That was a fear of a split. That, as you say, that fear that you're so close to Parliament that, you know, fighting with the right wing now is a distraction. Now look, I suppose thinking on it now, there's two things I would say about that. And obviously the first one is, well, you know, if you had gotten into Parliament with that mob in still in position, what sort of a Labour government would you have had? Um, yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, they, they would have they would have cut, you know, well, I, I won't say what I was going to say, but they would have done something unfortunate to Corbyn's government um, pretty much from day one, you know, pretty much from day zero, in fact. They, would, they wouldn't have stopped from what they were doing when they were in opposition. You know, they, because again, it's about this question, who did they, who are they defending? The other side of it, I would say, is this fear of a split. You know, well, look, it'll keep us out of government. It'll keep us out of power. You'd have to look at what then happened, wouldn't you? And you'd have to say... Well, what happened was a split. Mm. A split on the right wing's terms. Yes. You know, they got to decide who was going to leave, and they drove, you know, hundreds of thousands out. They, as, as you say, Matt, they clipped the wings of every MP that they didn't like and, and did some pretty awful things to some of them. And I think that shows maybe the difference, to be honest with you. They were very clear about what they wanted. They wanted control of the party. They wanted to make sure it was a safe, you know, vehicle for the British establishment. And if that meant losing an election, well, actually, losing an election was the whole point. Yes. Because they thought that would give them the lever, and well, it did actually give them the leverage to, to break back into power. But I think that's kind of for me the kind of the thing of it is: look, you had a split anyway. Yes. It was inevitable. You had two completely opposed camps in the Labour Party. You had the pa- the, the part of it that, for better or worse, reflected. Something of the mood of the working class reflected something of all these young people, and I was young once, believe it or not, um, all these people who felt a bit of hope and wanted to change society and wanted to go at it, you mm. know. And then you had the wing that represented the establishment. Mm. Um, mm. That cannot coexist. Yeah. Not forever. And we should be clear that we had a bit of an insight of what a split on the left terms might have looked like because you had Change UK. There was an attempt to kind of yeah. rerun the disaster of the uh, SDP when Chakra and Muna and the gaggle of, mm. you know, has been and, and Tory MPs split away and tried to form this new centre ground outfit in a Nando's, the funny tinge group, as they <laughs> labelled themselves. Um, and they were, they, they were hammered. They were absolutely hammered. They disappeared yeah. like a soap bubble because there was no enthusiasm for that. That's probably, certainly if there'd been a split in that way, with the right wing being shoved out in 2016, that's what would have happened. They would have disappeared like a soap bubble. If it happened even a bit later, probably, that's how it would have gone. And at least it would have happened on um, the terms of 
Corbyn and the left and the membership. But as it happens, now you've got a situation when the, the left has been has been split away forcibly. It's been decimated. And as you said, Matt, the right have completely stitched things up in Labour now. Mm. They've made it very, very difficult for anything to the left of Margaret Thatcher to be considered mm. as far as policy is concerned, as far as political positions are concerned. So that's the real tragedy, I would say. A split did happen, just not the one we wanted and needed. Yeah, but I think as well, you have to bear in mind at the time, you know, the the Labour right benefits from a lot of like media tailwinds. And as much as we, you know, want to try to subvert that, um, you know, the power of the media and talk directly to people, uh, people definitely pick up on narratives. And if we had tried what Keir did, um, it would have been a lot of negative publicity around it. It would have been framed in a way that would, you know, it would have been called Stalinist and whatever. Like it would have just been like, a, it would have been weeks and weeks of negative uh, coverage, maybe months of negative coverage. Um, I remember when there was a, a council leader called Claire Coba. this was January, 2018. And there was uh, moves to deselect her, uh, which was from the community, community, a grassroots campaign. It wasn't even anything I'd ever to do with momentum or anything like that, but they wanted to deselect her because of the um, Haringey development vehicle, which they, the community opposed. It was basically um, gentrifying areas of Haringey. And there was weeks of coverage about how dreadful this was it led like news night and like poor claire cobra how awful and this that. was just a no mark council leader right imagine if we tried to do it with all the mps on the labor right now if they moved as one if they showed some solidarity for a change um, and they all moved as one then that could have meant that we lost our you know, parliamentary opposition status as well. So there was all of, there was all of these risks. But even that said, I think it, in hindsight it was worth the risk because mm. if we managed to muddle through to government, exactly as you say, they would have had they would have held us to ransom. We would have had to have done it eventually. Um, I think the best time to have done it actually would probably have been just before the twenty nineteen election. It's a just go right now. Now, even though we're in a position of weakness relatively to 2017, um, because we didn't do it before the 2017 election, we didn't have the the NEC majority, and um, you know, that didn't come till later when we had uh, uh, when we were able to to install uh, Jenny Formby and uh, allies as general secretary. And by the way, all the other people that were involved with the party in, in the upper echelons before 2017 went to work for. The people's vote campaign so they basically did their wrecking operation from the people's vote um of course <laughs> and then mm. <laughs> but then i think like yeah the, the time to the time we could have done it theoretically would have been 20 just before 2019. Yeah, this is the issue though corbynism was um was no one predicted that it would happen no one including you know, corbyn including corbyn right it, there wasn't the the infrastructure there wasn't the um you know, everything had to be kind of reverse uh, retrofitted. So there wasn't the, the parliamentary support as well for Jeremy. Um, and until you are in a position where you're controlling the party bureaucracy and controlling selections, then you're never going to be able to govern like and have a socialist program. So it's worth the process of um, potentially being unpopular in the short term uh, in order to control the party and then once you've controlled the party then you can build everything else so you can build that parliamentary labor party support you can you can reshape the plp you can reshape the party you can democratize it um this is very very difficult to kind of convey um to to people and supporters and allies who believe we're really close to power already so that was the difficult thing to I think that was where the pragmatism, quote unquote, of like one more heave, we're going to get into government, basically meant all that other stuff, which was actually more important and would have meant the left would have been more powerful today, just fell by the wayside. You know, you've put me in mind of a quote by Frederick Engels, who identified a danger in the programme of the German social democracy of opportunism. I mean, where you try to avoid a problem in the short term and you make compromises in the short term in order to 
avoid, in Corbyn's case, uh, potentially damaging, splitting the party, the mm-hmm. negative press that would come with that. But ultimately, you sacrifice your success in the long term. I'm going to read it out, actually. It's only a paragraph. Mm. This forgetting of the greats, the principal considerations for the momentary interest of the day, this struggling and striving for the success of the moment, regardless of later consequences, this sacrifice of the future of the movement for its present may be honestly meant, but it is and remains opportunism, and honest opportunism is perhaps the most dangerous of all. Mm. I think Corbyn actually is probably the only honest man in British Parliament. Um, I think that he truly did intend to carry out a programme of reforms that would have helped millions of poor people, working people, young people. I think he really did believe it was possible to find a route to power without fully breaking with the underlying logic of the system. But I think that the compromises he made to do that ultimately sowed the uh, basis for his destruction. And unfortunately, there is a direct through line from that defeat to the fact that you've now got Labour in power, facilitating and funding a genocide, carrying out austerity, attacking protesters, absolutely liquidated the left wing. And I would say there's a through line to Johnson. There's a through line to Trump. There's a through line to the fact that Nigel Farage is still knocking about because there's an anger at the system that has no point of expression, which Mm. means that demagogues and hucksters can hijack that mood. Corbyn and the movement that he led and the defeat that resulted really are to blame for that. I mean, Corbyn himself, you could debate about how you know, historically radical his programme is. There's, uh, you know, it was, certainly was the most left-wing thing I'd ever heard at the time. Then you look back and, you know, well, Harold Wilson, what was he promising? The top 10, 5 or 10%? Mm-hmm. Uh, biggest monopolies in the country get nationalised, you know? So look, you know, there have been even more radical programmes, true. But again, you know, why was it that the press really went mad, you know, whenever whenever Corbyn so much as twitched a, a, a muscle? And I have to have to say, look, part of it, yeah, they didn't want to pay more tax, true. But actually, that wasn't the big thing. Mm. That really wasn't the big thing, in my view. What it was was simply this. They were scared of what he was whipping up in the in the general population. They were scared, basically, of what the British working class and the young people in particular might might get into their heads to do. And look, they've got a reason to do that. Look, just to delve a wee bit into history, if uh, people's patience will stand it. Absolutely, you're on the right show for that. Look, in 1926, you add the conditions where people were absolutely furious. They'd been pushed to their limit and beyond it. And it was clear, especially, you know, amongst some of the heavy battalions of the working class, we had, you know, the miners in those days, but also the dock workers, transport workers, whoever you like, shop workers for that matter, they were... Keen for action. And the TUC leaders, let's be clear about this, they didn't want a general strike. They had no intention of having such a movement. And we don't have to speculate on that because they were kind enough to write that down in in, in written language and and tell us. So there you go. But they said, look, this is going to happen one way or the other. The government isn't giving us what we want them to do, a a nice little crumb here and there to, to fend people off. Either we ride this wave and we try and get it into safe channels, or it's going to go beyond us. You know, they were pushed, in other words, into supporting the general strike and organising it. That's what the ruling class is afraid of when it comes to Corbyn, or was afraid of when it comes to Corbyn, I should say. Um, because he was creating this move, right? People, as, as we said very early on, politics before Corbyn, I don't know, all right, what's for dinner? You know, you weren't exactly, uh, you know, following it day to day. Suddenly millions of people are, you know, and they're drawing all sorts of conclusions. 2017, they had a very big scare. You know, and in 2019, look, that, they were not going to let that happen again. You know, I think this point again about the media, right? Like, um, they have to have these impartiality rules. Well, you know, there's a line, pirates are the Caribbean, you know, well, the, the pirates code is more like guidelines than actual rules, you know. That, it turns out that also applies okay, to the that's British a first media. on this show, in fairness, uh, pirates and Caribbean <laughs> reference. Sorry, yeah. carry on. Well, there we go. You, you, you work with what you got, you know. <laughs> but, um, but that's how it was. They were like, we're not letting that happen again. Yeah. You know, by God, we are not letting that happen again. And I think this really gets at the nub of it. This ingrained hostility comes from the fact that Corbyn is whipping up moods that he 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 himself may not be able to control. Actually, um, he's got to be destroyed, mm. you know, and th- and that's what it come down to, I suppose, for me, you know. And 
And you see the result, of course, you know. Um, at a certain point, I suppose, at a given point, every movement is asked a kind of a question, if you like. Look, here's, here's the two roads. You either go for it, and that means making some really powerful enemies, and yes, being dragged through the mud by them and all the rest of it. In other words, they will attack you, but you might win through. Or you try and moderate, and you, you sort of, you know, try and one weird trick your way into um, into getting around them. In which case, look, you risk losing your base, you risk losing everything you've built, and they still don't believe you. Yeah. You know. Um, and I guess, you know, you, you know, Wilson had that moment in the 60s, the Bank of England came to him and went, we're not going to let you put through his programme. And he went, all right, fair enough. <laughs> and he sort of, you know, put through this or that, but he certainly didn't nationalise to any top monopolies, I'll tell you that. And I think the Corbyn movement, I mean, it never got asked that question, you might mm. say, because it was destroyed before it could get to power. Yeah, I think that... Certainly post-2017, we did choose the the latter path that you outlined there, which was to try to accommodate liberal, establishment liberals. Um, and we saw that as part of our coalition. And that informed things like the position on Brexit. And ultimately, you know, that was that was harnessed. Well, that, that was used as a, um, a wedge issue. So the, the, mm. the, what we learned was like, obviously, the People's Vote campaign, people involved with that had ulterior motives. They didn't care about Brexit. I mean, many of them had gone to work for Starmer. Starmer said Brexit's happening. They were like, great, sign me up. They don't care about that. <laughs> they care about domestic politics. Mm. Um, so like, I think, I think if you rely on establishment liberals as being part of your voter base, as part of your coalition, then of course you know that you're you're empowering them almost to drive a wedge wedge in that base, um, and I think that uh, we have to build we had to build a coalition without them, and the the problem now is politics now is basically I think the the election in America shows this is that people are rejecting status quo establishment liberalism neoliberalism whatever you want to mm. call it the way things are has not worked since 2008. Um, and I think that uh, obviously living standards have declined and and everyone's everyone recognises that they're poorer. Everyone feels poorer. Everyone feels like things are not improving. And uh, if you can't offer an alternative to that as the left and the right appears to offer an alternative to that, then the right will win. Um, if, right. if as the left you're you're trying to comment, accommodate the very forces of establishment liberalism that have put us in this position in the first place, you will lose. The path we're on at the moment is very very dangerous. Without a, uh, a, a, a the Labour Party being the voice of the working class, without the Labour, Labour Party offering uh, fundamental transformative socialist policies, uh, then people will look elsewhere and and they'll look to reform and they'll look to a, a more right-wing Tory party. For me, when you say like you can you can basically trace back Trump and Johnson and everything to Corbyn's decision to be pragmatic in that moment or, or as Engels would say opportunistic, I think that's true. I think if we had prioritised controlling the Labour Party, then I think that the forces that have have emerged since 2019, the more right-wing forces um, would have been allayed. So, yeah, I think that that's a, a real lesson. If, and, and it's the same with the Democrats in America. If they'd allowed Bernie Sanders to be the candidate, then I think that, you know, things might have been very, very different. Trump may have lost. If they'd, if they'd embraced his politics, even under Biden, things may have been very, very different. But that's just not the way establishment liberals uh they 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 have this kind of like fish um uh horseshoe kind of theory perception where like you know the left is as bad as the right i mean that is so they they can never really be allies in a in a truly left wing po project i'd say that it's more than that i think that they think the left is worse than the right <laughs> yeah. because the reason that they aren't able or willing to accommodate the left is because they serve capitalism yeah. and capitalism is in a state of crisis they know that protecting the 
profits of the bosses is the priority. They know that protecting the foreign interests of imperialism is the priority. They cannot trust the left to do that. So when it comes down to it, the liberals are much more afraid of the likes of us, even the likes of Corbyn. Corbyn's not a communist. He's not a Marxist. But they're more afraid of that, as Sean said, because of what he can mobilise than they are of the right wing and the far right. You've talked about the wedge issue of Brexit. Let's talk about the other one, anti-Semitism. What was that like? Because that was one of the most disgraceful and disgusting episodes of straight up lies and slander and muckraking I've ever seen. Yeah, so I've I've grown I've I've grown up like around Jewish people. I I my my wife's family's Jewish. Um my business partner now I've started my my software company Gamban he's Jewish like it so to be you know, and I, I grew up on an education of, of the Holocaust and how how dreadful it it, it was, and 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 for me, anti-Semitism was always like the worst thing ever. Like that's the way I view it. It's like there's nothing worse than anti-Semitism, and to be accused of that, or to be accused of of supporting a project that was anti-Semitic, um, was extremely difficult to process. Um, as it happens now, uh, now I know how it was how it's. How it was used that accusation and how it was weaponized um it seems to it for me it's lost a lot of meaning i i you know it gets thrown around all the time by people who want to uh defend the israeli government and the actions of the israeli government i mean what has that got mm. to do with with you know being against, against jewish people uh, you know this is this is the thing that um I've learned is that for some uh for some people uh protecting israel is is is, is a fundamental uh objective you know it's absolutely absolutely the end game is to protect israel um and they'll use whatever means necessary uh, in order to do that and i think that what we should have done differently with hindsight again um is when the first accusation started we should have taken legal action it should have been uh, def defamation cases and it should have been um you know that 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 should have that should have put a marker down early on the problem was it got worse and worse and worse over time so like they're testing testing the boundaries all the time and until eventually you know a member of parliament says to, shouts at jeremy's face you're an effing anti-semite and that gets reported yeah. in the media Dear old Margaret Hodge. So, so that, so that was where we got to. And could we have done anything differently in managing it? I don't think so, because you're not dealing with good faith actors. These are these are. This was not. You know, th there were there were there were elements that are now like you know who were very um, vocal on anti-Semitism, who are now very vocal defending Netanyahu. So. Would whatever Jeremy had said to address the concerns of people, people may have had like genuine concerns about anti-Semitism, would that have been enough for those organisations? No, it wouldn't have. Of course not. Um, it would always have been something else and it would always have been uh, pushed, like moving things on to um, more and more kind of uh, outlandish sort of claims that would have, they kept kept this narrative going because the fundamental thing for them was to ensure that Jeremy never became prime minister because he was pro Palestine, and and that that would have completely changed the conversation around the Middle East. And uh, you know, you may events may have been very very different had had he become prime minister. Um, the occupation may have ended. There may, there may have been no, there may have been no October seventh. There may have been obviously none of the backlash since and uh, the response from Israel. So uh, that that's the thing. The, the situation in the Middle East was completely unsustainable in the long term. There was always going to be uh, um, a, a conflict uh, as a result of that. And there was absolutely no way that the, the, the people in, who supported uh, the, the Israeli government's policies were going to allow Jeremy to win, and that, and and that, that was it. It was you know 
looking at it through that lens now, like, I mean, I, I could call everything like uh, anti-Semitic and whatever. I mean, look, if I, if I'm the sort of person that if I think something or I believe something, I'll say it like, you know, <laughs> and this is the thing, right? And Jeremy's the same, like if, if we really, if, if there was really racism that we felt that we were racist or anything like that, it was, it was kind of like, we would just say it, right? We know we're not. So like, it's, it kind of became this like thought crime thing. Like people were sort of saying, well, does he not have a blind spot or, you know, doesn't he, I can sort of read between the lines here. I think that this, this means he doesn't like Jewish people. If he said, if he didn't like Jewish people, he'd say. I mispronounced Jeffrey Epstein's name. <laughs> yeah. So well, that must mean that he right, hates Jewish people. It's, it's, clear, you know? it, it, it's clear, you know, this is clearly nothing to do with that. This is the fact that he's been a, mm, a, a mm. Palestine supporter, pa- supporter of Palestinian liberation for his entire life. So this is the reason. So um, so now I just sort of look at it and I look back on that period and I'm just like, I could see, you know, you can see it through a different lens. And perhaps, again, that was naivety at the time. I, there were people, to be fair, because of all of the hysteria that had been whipped up, that did genuinely feel that they were unsafe or did genuinely feel that there was a problem. Um, but that, but then, then you think, well, who was whipping that up, that hysteria? Yeah, Basically, yeah the right wing did that. The right wing did that. The Blairites are to blame for that. If anybody genuinely felt unsafe because they were Jewish in the party, then it's the press that did that. It's the right wing that did that. It's the people who weaponized that question disingenuously to bring down the left wing movement. Exactly, and and like to 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 basically put fear into the the hearts of Jewish people in order to advance political ends. It's just absolutely absolutely appalling when you look at it like that. And that's basically what happened. Like. We did a lot of work. I just tell you one more thing. Actually, we did a lot of yeah, sure. we did a lot of work um, in the party to change the rules to make it easier to expel people who were anti-Semitic. Um, we wanted to make sure that that process was efficient. There were cases. I mean, it was a minuscule proportion of party members, right? But there still were. There was still, you know, that doesn't take anything away from the seriousness of the uh, of, of the actual incidents of anti-Semitism. So they needed to be dealt with. Um, and they were, uh, and when we obviously we had Jenny Formby as the general secretary, a lot of resources were invested in making this process efficient. Like basically, under the Labour right, under their, under the previous general secretary McNichol, the, the cases piled up. There were drawers full of them. They were just left alone. The only time they'd ever come out of the drawer uh, would be to be briefing the media about how bad you know Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party is. Right, that's what they were up to. Um, when Jenny Formby took over, there was a pr- proper process. So think about all of that, right? Changing the rules, making sure we get the, the Chakrabarti report and the, the rules changed in the party, putting all the resources into making sure that people are expelled efficiently, actually doing that proper job, right? And then Starmer wins. He has one Zoom call with Jewish communal organisations, right, that are aligned to... Uh, support supportive of Israel, basically, right? And they they press release after we're now confident that anti-Semitism issue has been dealt with. We can now draw a line under it. So this was never about dealing with anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Then this was not about that. That, that that's for me. That was all the evidence I needed. And look, there's one thing to start with. Look, you know, I, I think a lot of the left prides itself on on its anti-racism, and and rightly so. You know, it's obviously a very important struggle. So to be attacked on that level obviously does strike at the heart of a lot of these activists. And it was meant to. It was mm. not just a case... Yeah, I think, soft underbelly, that was yeah, the point. Yeah, well, look, at the end of the day, look, what you'd say is it's a demoralisation tactic. Mm. You know what I mean? In part. It's obviously, it weakens Corbyn in the eyes of the public. It also demoralises the people who are defending him. I think the big thing here is is what, what made it agonising. And I have to say, speaking from, from our perspective... You know, when I was in the CLPs, when I was talking to other members, even, you know, even uh, as a member of, of Socialist Appeal, which I have to say helped uh, with a lot of this. You know, look, what made it really agonising, I would have to say, is, is the response to us felt like, well, we've just been slandered, we've been attacked. OK, what's, what's Corbyn going to say next? And he would get up and sort of, well, I'm very sorry if people sort of feel like, you know, he would, he would apologise for this stuff. And maybe this comes back to the, the thing we said about the pragmatism, the... You know, dare we say a bit of the naivety of this idea? Well, look, we'll disarm it. I, I know Owen Jones was a big 
uh, sort of proponent of this, if I remember rightly, just apologise for it and move on. Well, the problem is they weren't going to move on. Once they figured out, ah, here we go, here's an Achilles heel, here's something we can really twist the screw on, they would hold on to that like a bulldog. And that's exactly what they did. And I think that's that. I would have to say most of the demoralisation, from my point of view, wasn't so much from the right. We knew those guys were were wrongins. You know what I mean? And of course, everybody logically knew. Look, in a party of half a million people, there are going to be some people who are, you know, all sorts of isms. You can imagine some real rotten uh, types. I mean, you know, you just look at the PLP for Christ's sake. But um, but I think the real demoralisation actually came from the fact that there didn't seem to be a fight back. But now CLP was not particularly remarkable. It had voted for Corbyn, I think, every time he was he had stood. And the only Jewish members we had in that CLP were, were lefties. One of them had been at Cable Street. She was quite elderly. Great old lass. Loved her. But, you know, um, I remember them getting really frustrated with this and saying, why aren't they saying what, what it is? Which is, these guys are whipping this up mm. so as to attack Jeremy for Palestine. Right. So as to attack the movement for Palestine. And of course, we've seen, uh, as, as you, Matt, said, and I, I'm sure you've seen, you know, I know you've seen it yourself, you've been on these marches, same as me. Um, we've seen what they say about these perfectly peaceful marches that go through, you know, London on this quest. Hate marches, Hamas mobs, and all. And I think that really took the wind out of the sails, I would say, of a lot of people. So I have to wonder what was the team thinking? Did they think that would work? And, and if so, why? And that's actually something that I have to come back on, Matt, because respectfully, you said that yourself and Corbyn were the kinds of people who would just say what was. That wasn't true in relation to this question, for Corbyn anyway, because he would apologise. And it was clear this was all delivered in bad faith. And I'm not sure that I agree that it was handled as best it could be given the circumstances. He never should have apologised. He shouldn't have given an inch of ground. Yeah, he would have been slandered. He was going to be slandered anyway, because it was a bad faith attack, as you say. He should have said, this is a politically motivated yeah. lie, a smear campaign whipped up by traitors in my party and by the right-wing press in order to bring me down. And anybody who perpetuates this, as you say, sacrificing the feelings of Jewish people in the country in general for political football is out. They are out of this party because they are using the dirtiest of tactics in order to win. And yeah. the right have no qualms about... Mm, yeah. They don't mind fighting dirty. They're mm -hmm. happy to win dirty. That's the real anti-Semitism, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. that you would treat this as a, you know, a factional weapon. Like, I mean, what does that tell you about the mentality of these people? And, and as I say, nothing is off the table. Like you just said, nothing is off the table as far as defending capitalism is concerned and as far as defending their own positions is concerned. Yeah, their careers and the capitalist yeah. system. You know, if some, some poor old creed, Jewish lass their religion. You know, gets terrified at the idea some Labour canvas is going to jump her in the street, oh well, you know, at least I'm going to get a nice paycheck and at least mm. the system remains in safe hands. And you just think, so I, I don't disagree with what you said, by the way. I think that, there, that we needed to explain why it was happening. But the pro one of the big problems is the public and the general perception, even in you know, in people who are kind of aware of politics and whatever, they don't understand factionalism. They don't understand that the Labour Party and forces within the Labour Party were working against the leadership. They just saw it as chaos and a chaotic leader, right? When Margaret Hodge says what she says, they think, well, if Jeremy's own side is saying it, that gives it more credibility. Attacking your own side is actually, it's much easier to do. It's much more effective because you basically, you look like you're trying to act in good faith when you're doing the opposite. You look like you're trying to um, put uh, your partisanship to one side for the greater good. From a comms perspective, I think uh, the fact that we, ha no, that we hadn't dealt with the Labour right through the political strategy, through you know these elections and through party discipline and party democracy and all that sort of stuff, meant that they were in a position to yep. amplify this. And and I think that this this is this is always like the, the, the prism that people like to look at politics through. They look at it through like, oh well, did we did we say the right thing at the right time? Did we have the right comms approach? Did we have the right crisis management approach? Or was our rebuttal strong enough? Actually, the problem was much further upstream. That's what led to this context where Jeremy was felt like he had to go out there and say, uh, 
you know, I'm sorry, like obviously I'm, I'm not I'm sorry, but there's been incidents of this in the party. It's disgusting. I oppose it unequivocally. Um, and yeah, maybe, you know, looking back, even, even in that context, he was too apologetic. He should have had it within that narrative. We will take um, any accusation of racism very, very seriously. And uh, there are people in this party that are whipping this up because of Palestine. I mean, he could have, he could have actually communicated that. I, I do agree. The point is, it's a process that all flows together. Yeah. And ultimately, it all ties back to what Engels was talking about. It's that honest opportunism. It's the, okay, if we can just calm this down, if we can just compromise here, if we can just mollify the right, just mollify the media, if we can just give a little bit of ground, then we can piecemeal our way to power without having to endure more of a backlash, without risking a split in the party, without getting dragged through the mud. Maybe we can put this story to bed. But it was never going to happen because it wasn't a concern that was raised in good faith. As you say, it was part of an overall strategy by a relentless and ruthless right wing who actually knew what they stood for. They stood for taking back the Labour Party for capitalism by any means necessary. And as far as dealing with the comms and this sort of thing... It doesn't hurt Trump when he's attacked by the establishments. The guy's got dozens of court cases against him. They threw everything in the kitchen sink at Trump. And every time they do, it makes him stronger because he can use it to prove his anti-establishment credentials. I genuinely believe that if Corbyn had said, they are doing this because they're afraid of you, the movement you support, they're afraid of me because I'm the figurehead of that movement and they are lying, that would have cut through. People would have understood that. The working class isn't stupid. People can see when attacks in bad faith are being used by the establishment to weaken somebody they see as a threat and a movement they see as a threat. I would say that the chaos actually came out of the attempt to manage this crisis (laughs) more so than the attacks themselves. Corbyn should never have given an inch to this. You know, look, I mean, like you said, the movement's going to get attacked, whatever it does. You know, if if anti-Semitism hadn't stuck, they would have found something else. Mm. Maybe he would have been a woman hater. Maybe he would have been... They tried that, actually. Yeah, now that I think about it, yes, they did, Mm. didn't they? Bloody hell, they really did try everything in the kitchen sink. But I I think this point about how you face that down is important. And and as you say, Matt, look, you can think about these things from like a Spock's perspective or or a comms perspective or a, you know, whatever you like. But I would say, look, there were, there were, there were probably at least 300,000 or 350,000 very good reasons, and that's probably over, overstating the amount that were right-wing, you know, members in the party who actually could very much have played a role in that. All they needed was a clear lead. You think back in the old Russian Revolution, Lenin gets tarred as a German agent, you know, and it does sink in for a bit, doesn't it? You know, but what happens? It's all the Bolsheviks on the, on the ground that are going in, they're known to people, you know, these rank-and-file workers, these activists, and going, oh, yeah, German agent, am I, lads? Yeah, OK, come on, you've known me for years. That That is part of it. You know, it's, it's mentioned in the accounts as, look, all this stuff do, doesn't have the ring of truth. And, of yeah. course, they didn't apologise for it, you know, as you can imagine. But I think it, it, it's in how you face these things down, I think, is what I'm trying to draw out of here. If you had, if he had come out swinging, you know, OK, maybe, maybe a couple of his, his advisors or a couple of the MPs might not have, oh, is that a bit fair? But I think what it would have done is it would have electrified a hell of a lot of people in the rank and file. And I have to say, that was the big weapon. You know, if people are motivated and energised, and as you say, they're not stupid, they can see what's going on. I do stand by what I think demoralised them was was the feeling that they were kind of left out in the cold and and being kind of forced to apologise for things they didn't know, you know, they knew weren't true, I should say. But look, not only is it true that the working class isn't stupid, right? It's also true that at that time, the party had a pretty significant weight in the working class. Yeah. Bigger than it had had for decades and decades. And that was part of, actually, I think, what led it to success in 2017. Everybody knew a Labour member, you know, and could check, well, what, what is actually going on here? Well, this mm. is what's going on here. The same thing could have been done here. Again, it's one of the great what-ifs, but if that, I, I, do, I do believe if that had been their approach, they would have smashed this slander on the head. Well, let's address the ultimate what if had Corbyn won Ooh. by whatever means <laughs> history allowed for it what would have happened Matt what do you think a Corbyn government would have looked like in when in 2017 or 2019 let's say 2019 let's say you've had the near win in 2017 they get their act together and they make it to power in 2019 having not dealt with the right wing 
Oh, um, it would have been extremely difficult. <laughs> it would have been extremely difficult. Basically impossible to govern with that parliamentary Labour Party. So lots of compromises would have had to have been made. I think it would have been very, very difficult, particularly the type of programme that we we, we had uh, pledged in the manifesto. You know, I don't think we would have got anywhere near that, to be honest with you. I think it would have been extremely difficult. And I think the right wing of the party sabotaging Corbyn's programme would have been part of it. But actually, whether it be 2019 or 2017, basically sneaking a reformist program through. And I remember that John McDonnell, after 2017, was basically on a charm offensive, having tea and cake with representatives from the city, mm. basically speaking to the capitalists one to one and saying, look, our program's costed. We're not going to carry out a program that we can't afford. We're not going to cause a run on the banks. We're not going to do anything that will fundamentally upset the capitalist apple cart so please don't sabotage us please if we get to power don't yeah. have a strike on the pounds don't try to overturn our government using market mechanisms we talked about naivety a few times i think that is the absolute height of naivety the absolute height of naivety you cannot modify and convince the markets they would not be convinced you're in a period of capitalist crisis they've got absolutely no faith not that Corbyn will cause damage to the economy through his program, which in the grand scheme of things, I mean, McDonald's economic program involved less spending than ultimately what the Tories spent during the, the COVID years. The point is, they were afraid of how far it could go. They were afraid yeah, of yeah. what a Corbyn government would mean as far as the movement behind him. Yeah. So I think that if Corbyn had been elected, you basically would have had a situation either like a left-wing version of what happened to this trust with her being shuffled out by market pressure, or you would have something like the situation that Syriza faced when they were elected and they were presented with a big austerity bill from the Troika, from the EU, European Commission, IMF. They put that to the people. The people say, no, we don't want it. We elected you on a left-wing program, not an austerity program. And they had to make a choice. So the choice they made in the end was to capitulate. And that caused immense damage that we don't need to go over here. But that, I think, is the option Corbyn would have faced. Do you take on mm. the capitalists? Do you lean on the movement, lean on your supporters and go further to implement your program? Or do you fold? I think that's what Corbyn would have faced had he won. Yeah, I think you're right. I think and it would have been extremely difficult with that parliamentary Labour Party, you know, to turn to have not folded. Yeah. Well, I think this gets at it, doesn't it? I mean, but this thing about the markets, I think it is worth kind of touching on because I think that is still an idea that kind of is in the movement somewhat that you can kind of, how to put it, sort of gull your way past them or, or you know, convince them that, ah, oh, you, you mean well in, in the end. Um, and I would say, look, you know, Rachel Reeves just recently, um, as a birthday present to me, put forward a budget. Um, you know, that had, had a certain amount of tax and spend in it, and the result was a sudden rise in, in guilt. It's not massive, granted, it wasn't anything to ma majorly worry about, but you could see already they're kind of getting a bit spooked, where, okay, tax and debt, where's this coming from? And what I would say about the market is is this, really, like, look, people have this idea that it's almost like an Im impersonal force, like, you know, like a machine that you pull levers on and it kind of produces certain results but actually it's not that at all it's you know you're not trying to ford a stream here to to use the metaphor it is if you like the capitalist class that you're dealing with and they have re interests they have real you know interests to defend um from their point of view if you have on the one hand they're fearing corbyn because of what he could whip up in terms of the class struggle how far the workers could go look i would say like trying to pacify the market which ultimately is for profit, is look at the mecha profit. Any measure that they think will harm that, they're not going to like, you know, and they are actually going to resist. Now, does that mean um, you have to give up on, 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 on fighting them? Well, no, absolutely not. You can take these people on, but I think it does mean you have to make a very difficult choice. Look, if socialism was easy, we'd already have it by now, but it is worth fighting for nevertheless. Um, and that choice is, do you face them down? Do you lean on the movement, like you said, Joe, and do you really go for it? If that means, by the way, breaking with capitalism, then so be it. Or do you or do you back away from the abyss because, well, you know, here be dragons. And, well, look, the, the result of that, and there is no maybe, that means you are defeated. You're done, you know, as a movement. You know, your base is smashed. 
you're out of power and the right wing come back in. That's what I would say. Matt, this has been a really fascinating discussion and I'm going to let you offer any final thoughts you have about the experience of the call-up and movements and what you think that the main lessons are for the class struggle in Britain going forward. Um, well, I'm glad it happened. And I think that I think that we have learned a lot from it. And I think that that's positive. I think that um, obviously what it's led to, the political conditions that it's led to have not been good. But I think the, the route back now for the left is to um, support other parties um, as a means to getting proportional representation. I believe that, that having that approach will enable the left to have a voice in government. I personally think that there's no way back really for the left in the Labour Party. Um, other people may have a different view, but I think that our best um, approach now, our most efficient use of our time and energy is, is outside of the Labour Party, which um, will only suck you into a vortex and, you know, burn all of your kind of enthusiasm for politics very, very quickly, particularly in the current moment. So um, all is not lost. Uh, I think there's a route back for the left, but I, I don't think it's in the Labour Party. We part company with Matt politically about this question of proportional representation. We do agree that the Labour Party as it stands totally stitched up by the right wing under Starmer with the anti-worker policies that they hold and the pro-imperialist policies they hold, that is a dead end, which is why we set up the Revolutionary Communist Party. And in our opinion, no matter what form of electoralism is used in Britain to decide who gets to rob you for the next five years, the main thing from our point of view is to build a serious revolutionary alternative. Because I can absolutely understand why the experience of the Corbyn movement would have burned people out. But there is a way out. There is a route back for people who want to see change in this country and beyond. Our view is that that requires a fundamental break with the capitalist system that ultimately facilitated Corbyn's destruction because they feared what stood behind him. You've got an open hand from the comrades of the RCP to join us in building that revolutionary alternative in Britain. And of course, if you're elsewhere, then to join any of the parties and sections and groups organised by the Revolutionary Commerce International. Matt, once again, it's been great to have you. Thanks so much. Really good chat. Thanks, guys. A spectre is haunting Europe, the spectre of communism. Communism is stronger, more determined than ever. Communist. Communism. The communist. The communist. The communist. Dedicated to the establishment of a new order. Just what is communism? I'll guarantee that ten minutes from now, a lot of you are going to have a new understanding of communism.